Well, a few months ago, uh, I think it was in November, that Pastor Dave said, hey, uh, I want you to speak on this such and such a date. Apparently, uh, Mark McClendon had already picked last week, and I began to prepare my message. And as I prepared my message, it really came clear to me that what God wanted to speak to this church was from Ephesians chapter 1. Little did I know until last week that Pastor Mark felt in his heart that God wanted to speak to the church from Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 6. And so last week he preached, and I at first thought, oh no, he's stealing my message. And then I realized, wait a second, I think God has a plan for this church. God wants to speak to us from Ephesians. And so I'm really excited to bring a message today that I would say is sort of a prequel A prequel to Pastor Mark's message. Last week, he spoke about aligning ourselves with Christ, aligning ourselves with God's will, and making sure that we are going in the direction of God. And he used a verse that I love. It's from Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, We are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I love that. It sounds good. And I love the idea of doing God's work. And I love the idea that I'm his masterpiece. And it sounds fantastic. How about you? Does that sound good to you? I think for most of us, we hear that and say, man, that sounds good. And and doing things that God prepared in advance for us to do, I mean, that just sounds awesome. But far too often, we don't really believe that we're that person. We don't really believe that God is actually speaking about us individually. And we see ourselves differently than what we read in Scripture sometimes. We don't identify ourselves with this calling of God. And so, though we like what we hear, we tend to wait for someone else to do it. Or we will look for someone else and think maybe they're the one that God is speaking to. When in fact, God is actually speaking about you. So I believe that a lot of us, even in this room, are not really convinced that we are the people that God is speaking about. And so today, we're going to talk about identity, who we are. Who are you? If I ask you that question, you might start out with your name, And then you might uh, go on to talk about what you do. And then you might tell me a little of your family background and history or where you lived. Or I don't know, if you were to ask me who I am, I'd probably say, I'm I'm Mike Rohde. I'm I'm one of the pastors at IES. And uh, I'm tall. Because every week someone says, you know, you're really tall. Without fail, it happens. But that's not the full of my identity, right? And in fact, God has a lot to say about who we are. And some of it we don't fully believe, but I think that today we're going to read a passage from from Ephesians that's going to talk about that. And I think it's going to challenge us to really trust what God has to say. So can we pray and ask God to just kind of ordain the rest of this morning so that we can hear from him and trust what he's saying to us? Lord, I thank you for your word. You don't tell us lies, you tell us the truth. You don't withhold from us, you show us the truth. And so, Lord God, I pray that we would listen to your word, and we would take it to heart, and we would understand how you see us and who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Identity is an interesting characteristic of the human nature. We have identity in a group setting and we have identity individually. Identity is who or what we think we are. It includes how we see our function and our value both in our family and our greater society. Value is very much tied up in identity. It's what distinguishes us from other people, but it's also what makes us connect with and makes us fit in our social context. Probably you don't think that much about identity. You just have one. Or you're developing one. Well, where does identity come from? It comes from experiences of life. 
It comes from the things that you've accomplished. It comes from the things that you've failed at. It comes from, from your interactions with people, maybe from your parents who have told you things about who you are and, and teachers that have influenced you and your friends or your social group that have shown you who you are. So identity is not innate. We're not born with it. It's not part of our DNA entirely. But we develop it over time. In our day and age, we tend to think about discovering our identity. Over time, we figure out who we are. If you have a teenager in your house, you know what that's all about. You have an identity for them, and they're still trying to find what they think is their identity, and you would really like to just mold the identity you have for them onto them, right? You know what? Historically, that's the more normal way. Historically, in ancient times and through most of history, people didn't go discover their identity. In fact, it was molded on them. They grew up in a community, in a family, and their, what their parents did became what they did, and who their parents were became who they were, and there was no perspective that there could be any other way, right? So identity is this process thing. There's both the molded, you are this, told from the outside, and then you become this from the inside. But what I want to talk about today is very important for us, and that's how does God see us? Because God's perspective on our identity is really important because, in a sense, it's the molded identity. God says, you are this. And he says, I'm not really. Uh, but, but he says, yes, you are. But then there's also the process of discovery where he wants us to move towards that identity and to be shaped by it and become that. And so we actually see both forms of developing identity in what God calls us to. So I have a special guest this morning who is going to come and she is going to read scripture for us. I have it up here, don't worry. So Leandra, would you come on up here? All right, but what the gay Leandra Pierce, would you read us Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Thank you very much. You can head back down to Kids Church. We appreciate that. No, she's not one of the kids from Kids Church. She's our intern for the next month. And we are really glad to have Leandra here. Yeah. Thank you, Leandra. Now, when we read a passage like this, we have to be really, I have to be honest. I think that most of you, when you read this in your devotions, read through it and you think, wow. There's a lot of very complicated lingo there. And uh, you just keep moving. You hear a few good things, you go, yeah, that's nice, but you keep moving. I want you to know, when I was in grad school, uh, and I was taking Greek exegesis class, that means you take Greek and then you figure out how to read it in Greek good enough to like figure out what it says, we had to translate this passage And in Greek, this is basically two really long run-on sentences. So if it sounds bad in English, it's really bad in Greek. And so it is a little bit 
complicated to grab hold of what's here. But it's really interesting what this passage is doing. See, Paul, the reason he's got this long run on sentences, Paul is just so excited to communicate with the Ephesians and say all this stuff. What God has done for you is amazing. Oh, I'm so excited. And he just goes, blah, 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 blah. And this is what we end up with. So this passage might be a little bit hard to grab hold of, but I want to break it down for you and and make some bullet points so that you can grasp what God is saying. See, because what Paul is saying is God did certain things for you, and he did them because of how he sees you and what what he values in you, and he did them because of his nature. And if I say that and we say amen, you'd walk out of here going, wow, that wasn't much of a message. So let's dig in and let's see some of these bullet points that were here. Because I believe what how God sees me, how he perceives my identity, if I really believe it, then I can really start to say, when I hear God say stuff like, I am a masterpiece and that he's got work for me to do that he's planned from the beginning of the universe, that I can really believe that's me he's talking about. When I believe God's identity for me, then I can start to become who he says I am. So what does he say first? Interesting. In the Bible, a lot of times when things are said more than one time, that means they're important. First thing he says here, God chose you. And that's like the fifth thing he says too. God chose you. You. And when, when, when Paul is writing this, he's not just speaking about them as a group. He's also speaking about them as unique individuals. People. God chose you. See, when God speaks, it's powerful. You say, Pastor Mike, I, I'm not sure how does that work. Well, how did he make the whole universe? He said, uh, let there be light. Oh, let the water separate from the land. Oh, let the fish swim in the sea. Let the animals walk on the ground. He made things happen by his command. God's word is a powerful thing. And what he says right here, right now, is God chose you. And in the massiveness of his creation, in the multiplicity and multitude of people, God chose to create you. It's not an accident of a hot night in your parents' apartment. It's not an accident of some moment of of pleasure. It's God's choice that you are here. It's God's choice that you are here. Think about that. God chose you. He chose me too, but he chose you. He chose you. I mean, it's a very simple phrase. I can't say it too many times, but the reality is most of us don't really believe that God chose me or you, right? How many of you have ever been on the other side of that? You've been in the group setting where you were not chosen. Some of you in this room have probably even heard from your parents that they would rather you weren't there. But God chose you. It was his choice for you to be here. And that is really important. Because God Yes, he chose everyone else, but he chose. It was his call, his choice, no one else's. Secondly, God's plan from the beginning was to adopt you as a son. Now, ladies, don't get offended by this. In the context with which Paul is writing, the son has the inheritance right, correct? In that context. And so God is speaking and saying, listen, I chose you, period. Man or woman, I chose you to have the rights of inheritance. 
Now, the word that's used here for adoption is really a legal term saying that someone was going to receive the rights of inheritance. Abraham complained to God, Oh, God, I don't want to have to leave all my stuff to Gehazi, my servant. You said you'd give me a son. Where is he? But he was thinking about maybe he needed to adopt Gehazi. I think Gehazi is his name. But anyway... The idea of adoption was a real regular occurrence in that day, and it always had to do with inheritance. If you don't have someone to pass your stuff to, you adopt someone and you give them inheritance. Now, the amazing thing is when God chose you, he chose to adopt you. It was his plan from the very beginning. It wasn't some secondary, hey, oh, gee, they sinned. I need to fix this. It was actually God's plan from the very beginning that he would adopt you and give you the rights of a natural-born son as an heir. You. Who else is a son of God with full rights of inheritance? Who? Who? Jesus. That's who I'm thinking of. Also the person next to you that believes, that trusts in God. So you, God selected you to be adopted as Jesus' brother to have full rights of inheritance. You think about that. That's not a small statement, is it? That's not a light concept. And to be honest, I think it's hard for some of us to believe, but God doesn't fool around with this stuff. He's telling us very clearly through Paul. God chose you and he made you to be adopted. Now, what else did God do? Oh, when sin messed us up, God redeemed you You were purchased back. So he didn't just plan for you to be adopted, but then when you were messed up, he said, I'm not going to let him go. I'm not going to be like that. I'm not just going to like start over. I'm going to take that person and I'm going to buy them back. So Jesus goes to earth, dies on the cross in your place. And I know we have a hard time grasping it because it's one guy and we're so many of us that have been chosen and adopted, but But Jesus' perfection then is applied to us, and God has redeemed us. He could have started over. It was no problem for God to wipe it out and start over. But he didn't want to, and we're going to see that in a minute. Next, point number four, I love this one. God lavishes his grace upon us fully knowing and understanding what we've done. It says in full knowledge and wisdom. God lavishes grace on us. What does that word lavish mean? How many of you uh, remember back in the 80s? Okay, I know you're all too young, right? But some of you will remember back in the 80s, there used to be this show called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And in the intro, it always talked about they live lavish lifestyles. And you see all these rich people just like, you know, overflowing, you know, pouring champagne in their cereal and all that kind of stuff, just over-the-top living. That's where I think I first got the idea of lavish Lavish is when you just give it way more than is needed. You just, you put in far more than is necessary. For me, I like cake. Actually, cake is not what I like. Cake is a carrier for frosting. Frosting is what I like. I like a certain kind of frosting, particularly buttercream frosting. And when I make a cake, I make a cake, nice cake, good cake, and then I lavish it with frosting. You know, if, if, if your cake doesn't have at least a centimeter to a centimeter and a half of frosting, what good is it, right? I lavish it. When I make peanut butter sandwich... 
I don't, I don't get it. When I, when I go get one of those Kaya toasts, there's like, there's like toast and this little tiny glaze on it. I'm like, I, I make peanut butter sandwich. I'm like, there should be like one piece of bread, one piece of peanut butter, and another piece of bread. You know, so it's like, bleh, lots of peanut butter. Those little jars, they only last about three or four pieces of toast with me. I need the Costco size. I lavish it on there. Far more than is necessary. But I'm not eating it for the bread, am I? I'm eating it for the, for the peanut butter. Oh, and the honey. Dripping. That's how God extends his grace to us. It's not necessary. God could give the bare minimum. Have you known people that are always willing to do something and then it's just exactly barely what it needs to be done? And we have to admit, we kind of feel sometimes like we didn't quite really get enough. God's not like that. God doesn't do just what you need. He does way more than you need. He lavishes his grace on you. You say, Pastor Mike, you're really exaggerating here. No, I'm not. This is the words. This is the terminology that's used. God lavishes. And and what I think is that a lot of us don't really believe it. That God selected you, personally you, created you in his creation for a purpose. Like, I need, I need this person in my creation. And then he said, and and I'm going to make that person to have full inheritance rights as a son, just like Jesus. And, oh man, I need to buy him back, get him back from sin. And, and, and I want to just lavish my grace. I know they're imperfect, but fully knowing everything they've ever done, I, I want to show them grace because I love them. And, and then on top of all that, what does he do? He reveals his will to us. He says, I'm not going to hide it from them. I'm going to tell them. I love them and I want them and I desire them. Now, these are awesome to understand and it's good to see what God has done for us and, 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 and it's amazing, but there's something more here. There, this isn't all there is in this passage. See, there's this little word. Um, as I said, I, I took Greek. So, so uh, the extent of my Greek at this point is like four-letter words. Uh, so there's a word called kata. You have it in Bahasa Indonesia too. And it kind of means sort of a same thing. It's a connector word with directional intent. Um, kata, uh, kind of, it, it, it's, a, it's a connector word that associates two things in direction and even proportion or causality. We use in English the word according to. Kind of gives you that that kind of harmony concept. This happens because of this, or according to this, in in light of, or in line with this. So all of these things that God has done for us, all these things that God has said about us, are done in accordance with something else. Kata. So, we see that God chose you, and God's plan from the beginning was to adopt you as a son, kata, according to his pleasure and will. You think about that. God chose you. And God decided that you would be an heir and a son just like Jesus because of his pleasure. God's pleasure was was why he chose you. It made God happy. It pleased God to choose you. And it pleased him to make you an heir, a co-heir with Jesus. God was happy. He didn't do it begrudgingly. He didn't do it because, oh, I better do it or I'll like, look like an idiot because my, my whole creation's messed up. No, he did it because, man, he loves you. He chose you. He, he was enthusiastic to do this. It was because of his pleasure and will. 
God is pleased to choose you. Secondly, God redeemed you and you were purchased back. God lavished his grace upon you, fully knowing and understanding what we've done. Kata, because according to his riches of grace. So my redemption and the lavish grace of God is according to or because of his riches and grace. You know what it's not because of? It's not because of anything I did. It's not because I'm cool. It's not because I'm tall. It's not because I have this really nice white hair. It's not because I am good looking. It's not because I'm goofy. It's not because I'm good with kids. It's not because I'm American. It's not because I'm a guy. It's not because I'm a good dad or a husband. It's not because I work hard and accumulate wealth. It's not because I lead well. It's not because my business is successful. It's because God is rich. He chose by his pleasure and he redeemed out of his riches and it doesn't depend on me. That's powerful. It doesn't depend on you. People have told you all sorts of things about your life. I mean, some of us were really pushed and pushed and pushed. And we felt growing up that if we didn't do well in school, we were nothing. Or some of us felt like we were nothing because we couldn't do well in school. Some of us were told, if you're not pretty, you ain't nothing. And so you pursued beauty. But you know the emptiness of that. But what God is telling us here is he has done this because of his pleasure and will and out of his riches and nothing to do with us other than that he made us. God loves you without restraint and he values you and you really are what he says about you. And then thirdly it says he revealed to us his will according to his plan designed by his will. That just it's, it's, He's making it very clear. It's all about him. He is the reason, and he loves you. Why does it matter? Because I think we all grew up in a setting where at some level we felt like we had to do something to attain value. Some of you more than others. The longer I've been in Southeast Asia, the more I've heard stories that make me sad of how people have perceived their value based on what others have said or how others have treated them. I've watched my own kids struggle with it here. But our value is not dependent on what others see. Our value is not dependent on what we accomplish. And so we have to ask the question about our own identity. Is it it tied up in accomplishment or accomplishing things? Or is our identity caught up in accomplishing God's plan and fulfilling his will. You know the awesome thing about God's plan is he chose me because it made him happy. I'm already in the will of God. He chose me because it made him happy. I don't have to do anything to receive that. Is your identity tied up in beauty or pleasure of others? We have to be honest. Some of us were told if, if we're going to be valuable to our parents, we have to achieve certain things. Some of us were told very directly and some of us very indirectly. 
I have to admit, it took me a long time to figure out that doing math had nothing to do with my value. I couldn't do it, and it didn't make me any worse. For some of you, it's much more significant issues than that. And I know some of you carry that with you throughout your life. God is telling you this morning, that's not your identity. What makes you valuable? God makes you valuable. If you've been left behind by people, that doesn't make you invaluable, unvaluable. God makes you valuable. God created you. God made you. God purposed you into existence for his pleasure because he wanted you to be here. And that is your value. If we don't believe what God says about us, we will not believe that we have a place in his kingdom. And we will not believe that we have a purpose or role to fulfill in God's kingdom. And we will not believe that we have the, a value that God has placed on us. If we don't believe these things, then we cannot be aligned with God's will. We won't fulfill the great passage that we read last week. Ephesians 2, 8-10, through 10, this is what it says. And you think about it in the context of what we said. If you believe what God said about you, it says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If I believe what God said about me, if you believe what God said about you, then we can believe this. And we can go forward in life in confidence, knowing full well that this is doable, because God said it, and he's happy with me. He's pleased for me to be here, and he made me a co-heir with Jesus, and he'll enable me to do what he's called me to do. 